share my screen here. And then I'm going to do the classic speaker move of, is this working properly for everyone? Can you see my screen? Cool. Do, 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 do. Everyone can see it. All right. So we are going to jump right in. So today's topic, converting leads online, uh, which you should know because you signed up for the webinar. So basically the goal today, we're going to walk you through the process of how you should do it. Um, I should come to Kelowna. I keep meaning to it. 100% is that place in my head where if I were to move somewhere else in Canada right now, it would be Kelowna. Yet I've never been. Um, it's like how if I want to retire in Costa Rica, yet I've never been there. Kelowna, Costa Rica are my two like places I would move to without having been there before. Random aside. Um, so converting leads online. We are looking at how to do this because this is, we honestly see this is the biggest struggle that's out there, um, which is highlighted in my favorite presentation video I've ever made. <laughs> Uh, no, that's it over there. <gasps> yeah, that's it. Just to the right of the one you're looking at. So, this is a really good example of online leads because, like, everyone thinks it's that like that next stage is going to be the one they have to get over, and we see this all the time when people are generating leads, and. So there's also this thing we see a lot where people like, just get me on the phone with someone, I'll close them. And I like I can't tell you how many times someone has called us up here just at home to generate them leads. And it's like, I just need to get people on the phone and I'll close them. And then statistically, that's just not true. Um, otherwise, everyone's business would be a lot bigger than it already is. So we want to walk you through today kind of what you need to do to convert more leads. Because right now what we see is that the biggest thing is like the conversion step. So like when we're looking at like the wheelhouse marketing framework, the conversion steps, the biggest miss that a lot of people have, that's where the most leaks in the bucket happen. Um, and so what I always say is like, before you start consistently trying to generate leads, build out your conversion framework first. So that when you start sending leads in, you have something. Then over time, you start improving that. But if you're out of the gate, just picking up the phone and they're just like calling them and all that, like you have no formal way to like keep track and take notes and have any automations, you're throwing money away at that point. So what you first want to do, start at the end here, work it out, and then go build them. The other big thing we see with online leads is a fundamental misunderstanding of what leads are. So you guys have all at some point either said it or heard someone say it that said like online leads are crap. Um, often use more different language than that, but you know exactly what I mean. Online leads are crap. But I think that's a misunderstanding of what a lead is. Most people, when they say that, are expecting prospects. So as prospect is someone who's going to move, they just don't know if they're going to use you, another agent, or do it themselves. A lead is just a lead on a potential prospect. So these doesn't mean they're anywhere close to moving or anything like that. It's just a list of people. And in there, there might be some prospects for you to try and convert. But when a lot of people think about online leads, they think they're generating prospects. They're not. So that's where the big, I think, misconception is. So what we're talking about, like converting leads, it's sifting through the leads to find prospects and then converting the prospects into clients. And that's a very distinct thing and an important distinction to know when we're looking at lead conversion. And to keep the mountain analogy going from the Simpsons video, um, there's essentially two stages of lead conversion. There is the people who are ready to go now. So in the mountain climbing world, because I've never climbed a mountain before, but I'm going to use the analogy like I do. Um, you're ready to climb it. You're ready to get go for the summit today. That's getting them to become a client. The next stage is you're waiting for the storm to pass so that there's an opening so that you can go up top, but you don't know when that's going to be. And the reason I say that is anyone who's been in the business more than a couple of years has been told by a prospect, I'm probably going to be moving about two or three years from now. So why don't you follow up with me then? And then three months later, you find out they bought or sold, right? Like, as, like I can't, like, like out of curiosity, if that's happened to you or you know an agent that's happened to, put it in the chat. Um, this happens all the time. Like plans can change. Like, so you can't just say, okay, they followed, they said they're going to move in two years. I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to follow up with them in one to get ahead of them. 
No, it could be two months from now. It could be, it could be five years. It can go the other way too. Plans change with people. So you have to always be ready for when the storm clears and they're ready to go. And, and yeah, and sometimes buyers are lying about it, but sometimes just legitimately their plans change. Like maybe someone got fired. Maybe that perfect home they didn't think would be available came up and they changed their plans to fit that perfect home, right? Like in what they're doing, they might think they're telling you the truth when they tell you it, they just didn't realize it. So you have to basically look at when your lead comes in, are you ready to work with them? If not, can you sit and be ready to work with them so that whenever they are, you're ready to jump. And that generally isn't, I'm going to wait a year and then follow up with you because you said two. So when you're doing this, there's a couple of things you need, obviously. And this is kind of, if you're in any Facebook group online, what CRM should I use? And everyone responds. Uh, I mean, now people just kind of respond, talk to your broker or the one that you use, all that stuff. Basically, you need to figure out your conversion system and then get the CRM that fits with it, right? So for example, um, do you want every lead to come in, have an automation that shuts off if the lead responds to it? Then you got to look at CRMs that can do that. Um, do you want to have a dialer built in? Do you want to have it integrate so that you can put an MLS number and it'll automate pre-populate stuff? Like there's a lot of features out there that you have to look, does it fit with what I want? Does it integrate with the tools that I'm using? Um, for example, like KV Core does a lot of things really, really well. And for majority of use cases and for a lot of people, that's provided free by brokerage or brand. And that gets most of the way there for a lot of people. Then there's some who would like to kind of go to something like follow up boss. Like I would say the majority of our clients um, who do a lot typically end up using um, follow up boss for online leads, but that's follow up boss is great for working online leads as an example, but it is not necessarily as good for like a repeat and referral type of business. So depending on your needs, you want to look at what you're going to do, but a CRM is definitely needed. So there's no question about that. Um, depending on how many leads you generate, you might want to look at something like a dialer um, that'll just help you speed up that process. But you know, if you're generating 30 leads a month and that's what you want to convert, you don't necessarily need like a dialer built in. So again, it's looking at your specific needs, but CRM is basically the main tool that you need besides like your phone, but I'm not going to list the phone as a tool of the trade when it's like everyone already has one, you know, you need a phone, you know, you need to talk to people on the phone or text them and do different things like that. Um, and then I see a question come in. How do I feel about KV core CRM? I think it's good. Like it gets, I mean, like I was mentioning before, um, a lot of our clients do use follow up boss and it, but KV core, it's included for most agents for free, I believe, um, as part of like the fees a lot of people are paying already. Um, and it gets you probably 90, 95% of the way to what it does for no extra cost for a lot of people. Um, it can be quite complex where like follow boss can be a little bit on the simpler side, but you pay for it. Um, but at the end of the day, I would rather you use it. Like we have clients who use it and it works well for them and they convert. Um, don't overthink the specific tool you're using necessarily just start using it. It's not that hard to switch as you're getting through and you want to like optimize the process, but I'd rather you have something like that going. Um, so I would personally, like if you have KV core, um, don't jump into it and like, be like, okay, let's go. Maybe I should consider this, this, or this, just jump in and start generating leads, converting leads. And then as you're going through the process, think about where the pain points are, which I'll talk in about a bit and how to solve them. And if for you, that specifically means maybe you want to jump around, then you can change. Um, and then when you're in your CRM, one thing you want to start doing is how can we start segmenting your database? So that could be as simple as like one thing that I love to do in a real estate agent's um, platform is looking at, can I just tag the neighborhood everyone lives in? And the reason I want to do that town and neighborhood is so that if I want to send a single email out at some point, then I can like to everyone in one neighborhood, I can just pull up the list and say, everyone who lives in this neighborhood, send them this email. Everyone who lives in this neighborhood, send them this email. That's a good place to start. Eventually you want to get into things like, do I want to be able to tag? Like, here's everyone who's like young family with kids. 
here's everyone who are investors. And over time, you can start sending really specific messages and making it very specific for that person. And when you can tailor a message to someone who's more interested in it, you're going to get more responses from it. But that starts by categorizing. So what I always say is mm -hmm. if you haven't done any segment in your database, don't think you have to like drop everything you're doing and go through your list and do it. But just take like 10 contacts a week and just start adding tags for what like the neighborhood they live in and the type of transactions they might be interested in. And that way down the road, you can start sending those out, but it starts by segmenting and putting that data in there. And then over time, as you're going, you can set up some automation. So based on the actions they take, they can start self-segmenting. Um, but that can get really into the weeds and like how to segment and set up those automations. But for now, just start doing something as simple as past clients, neighborhood they live in, and are they investors or not, that type of thing. But then over time, that can become more and more complex. But we like to start off with a simple process and having the neighborhoods is a really easy and simple way to do it. Then metrics. So there's a couple of metrics to always kind of be paying attention to when you're doing lead conversion and lead gen. Um, so on the conversion side, you kind of look at a, the two main ones, which would be how much or not two main ones, but basically at the, before you start looking at conversion rate, like how many am I converting to clients? Cause that takes time. You want to look at engagement rate. So you want at least 20% on the low end of your leads to be responding to the automations. So if you're like automating a drip campaign or an action plan or whatever, however you call it, if at least 20% aren't responding yet, you start need to make some big changes. And then over time, like with your calls and texts and emails, you can get that number up significantly. But especially with some automations, you want to make sure you can hit at least 20%, assuming you're not even calling. Then from there, when you're looking at like conversion rate, I mean, you've probably see the stat all the time that, you know, the average conversion rates under 2%. Um, that's true, but that includes the people who don't call leads and things like that. Um, you should want to aim for between three and 5% after 12 months, because one thing is like, say you're converting 2% today and for the next 12 months, well, you convert 2% of next year's new leads, but then you convert 1% of last year's leads. And so over time that adds up to that three to five, I think the best agents at online lead conversion, generally in that like five to six, we've seen the odd one get closer to seven. Um, but it's not always accurate. And another important thing to note, like when you are converting leads and you're kind of calculating your numbers, make sure you understand the numbers. You have to include even all the fake leads that come in. You have to include those in that number you're calculating. Fake leads count towards the total conversion rate. There's always going to be a percent of your leads that aren't real. That's just how the internet and people work on there. Um, don't take those out. So like sometimes I'll see people be like, oh no, I convert 30% of my online leads. Well, they're only talking about the ones that they have full-on conversations with. That's not looking at the metrics appropriately to give you a good benchmark. So anytime you see someone talking about their conversion rate, make sure you know kind of the specifics of it there. And then over time, as you start advertising more, you want to look at about for an ad spend side. For every about $500 you're spending in ad spend, you should be getting a closed transaction out of it. But again, that takes time to get there. I'm sorry, my dog's barking a little bit. Maybe there's someone at the door. <laughs> um, and the big one we also see in the industry is the speed to lead dilemma. Like when I started in the industry 10 years ago, I was told you got to get to the leads within the first 30 minutes. And then it became the first 15 minutes. Then it was the first five minutes, then two minutes. I think now people say you got to get to them in the first 30 seconds. And then I heard this story about the Houston airport and it really clicked for me. <laughs> Uh, there's talking about the Houston airport where they're getting a lot of complaints that people were waiting for to get their bags too long uh, from the baggage carousel after they got off their plane. So they were trying everything they could do to shorten the time it took to get from the plane with the bags to the carousel. And they were able to cut the time in half that it took for them to get the bag to the carousel. The number of complaints didn't change. And then they tried a new approach and were able to get rid of 100% of complaints. And all they did is they made the walk from the plane over to the baggage carousel twice as long because people felt like they were taking action. So because they felt like they were taking action, they weren't going to complain when they got there because their bags were there. 
So that's really why your walk at the airport is so long. But there's ways to apply that same thinking to your real estate leads as well. And we're going to show you some ways to do that. So one of the things I always recommend is creating a touch point map. And what this is, is from the second you think of potential lead could hit wherever they're going to find you, map out every single thing that they're going to touch until they're basically a client. So you start at like, if it's a Google search, it's going to have them find you, or they're going to go to, you know, see a listing online, click through on it, the form they fill out, the email they then get, the thank you page they see, the email, text, everything. Like map every individual point that they're going to get touched by something of yours, both from you personally and from what they're going to see on their screen. How does that all look? You want to have that all mapped out and then you can start seeing where there's potential gaps, where things aren't necessarily like consistent or the messaging might change at some point during it. If you've never gone through your own conversion system, put yourself through it like you were a lead so you see what they see. You'd be surprised at how many times I've had basically like team leaders opt in as a lead and just seeing what that process looks like and then realizing it's a lot different than they thought it was going to be. So you want to be able to go through and check that out. And then also think about where are they in position to you? And I'm really kind of beating a dead horse with the mountain climbing angle, but you want to know where they stand and the relationship that they're having with you, right? Um, and one of the things we really like to do is think, okay, this lead, depending on the source it's coming in from, do they already believe I'm the best realtor? Do they believe I'm an expert? Have they heard my name before? Because how you follow up then is going to change depending on how well they know you and trust you already. Because if it's someone opting in on a listing, it's possible they have never seen your name. They might not even have seen your name attached to that listing when they were looking at the page. They just saw, hit like a contact realtor and didn't even realize it's you specifically, right? And when you respond to a lead like that, the type of messaging is going to be different than responding to someone who already knows who you are and trusts that you're an expert. And that's like, a, you have to take that into account when you're planning out that touch point map is like, what should the messaging be when they're going through the process? And before they even become a lead, you can make them easier to convert. And that like, if you're putting out great content, you're building name recognition. And like, for example, I noticed when I launched our show, the quality of conversations when we do book a sales call with someone went up exponentially from what it was before. Cause now they're already getting to know me. They're seeing me out there in a way that's just, it's simple and easy. And now they're getting that opportunity to be like, okay, I know what I'm getting into. I know who they are and I don't have to sell them as much on me. I just more have to see if it's a good fit for both of us. And so this is one of those really powerful tools from content. It's not just about getting more people to find out that you exist. It's getting the people that do reach out and making them easier to convert when they do. So you'll typically see that people who put out a lot of consistent content have some of the highest conversion rates out there because everyone's already warmed up by the time they get there. So before you're even like making the lead, there's things you can be doing to make them easier to convert. And consistent content is one of the ways to do that. But when you get a lead, the first stage is contact. The first thing you have to do is keep your promise of whatever you said. Um, I see this a lot where someone will be like, they generate a lead and then they don't send them whatever they asked for right away or relatively quickly. They're like, well, you know, I want to ask you a couple of questions before I send this to you. or I want to try this before I send it to you. No, like whatever you offered them, you have to make sure they get it quickly. Then we look at the next phase of following up, but whatever it is, you have to make sure they're getting it and you communicate that they're getting it. And then we go to the next step, but I know it's an interesting thing for me. And this is what we talk about with like the speed to lead. When, if you get a new lead, you have to get to them really quickly if you're not having anything in the process, right? So like if all they're doing is now waiting for you to call, of course you have to get there as fast as humanly possible. Cause all they're doing now is waiting for you and getting impatient. But what if we gave them an action to take, like a long walk to the carousel to pick up their bags? So we call it a double dip offer only because I'm a fan of Seinfeld and I couldn't think of a mountain analogy to, analogy to throw in here. 
Um, but basically the idea with a double dip is they opt in now give them another offer related to it. So if, you know, probably everyone in this industry at some point in their life has run a, what's my home worth campaign or a home eval, whoever you want to call it, run that they opt in. Most time what happens is it says, thanks. Our team will be in touch soon or just pops out a number. But you want to think here is I already know this person a little bit. I know they want to know what their home is worth. Well, I want to make sure that's someone who's thinking of selling. So on the thank you page, instead of saying thanks, we'll be in touch. Be like, great. Our team is going to start building out your home eval and sending you the report soon. In the meantime, do, would you like a copy of our guide on how to get a home ready for sale? Click below to download your copy. Now you know if they download that, they're also thinking of selling because they might only have wanted to find out their home is worth out of curiosity. But then if they follow that up by downloading a guide on how to get their home ready for sale, you know they're almost for sure a likely seller. So now they got an extra piece of value. You're giving them some action to take, giving you a little bit more time to follow up with them. They download that guide. You then can go to another offer, double dip again, and be like, great, that off that guide should be in your inbox in a couple of minutes. Do you know the type of home you want to buy when you move? Start searching our listings here or tell us a little bit about the type of home you want and we'll send you a custom curated list. See, like we're giving them specific actions to take and each of those actions they take, the more information we get about them and then the more information and data we have, the better we can convert them while we're working through the process. So we're a big fan of the double dip. Um, and then you can also apply, we'll call the godfather modifier um, to the double dip. Basically the idea with this one is to find the fast moving people. So the leads that are ready to go now. So instead of saying, hey, you're thinking of, you know, they offer in on a, what's my home worth? And you offer them like a guide on how to download a home for sale. You can say something like, if you book a call with our team in the next 72 hours, here's what we'll give you to get your home sold. Be like, we'll stage your home. We'll send HD photos. We'll do um, cleaners out to your home before. We'll give you a day with a handyman, blah, 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 like yada, yada, yada. You know, like listing out everything you would do for a seller on one page, but like book a call with our team. Here's what we're going to give you. The idea being what you put on that page is that anyone thinking of selling their home, the offer is too good for them to pass up. So you're getting those people who are thinking of moving now to put their hand up. And that's a really important way to do it. Um, now, obviously more people would download a guide then book a call about selling their home because not everyone's right there with this. But this in theory would be kind of that golden lead if you get that page set up well. Um, when you get that lead in, I'm not a fan of voice. I was like, call every lead. Like first thing you should always be doing, pick up the phone and call them and see if you can get them on the phone. So if you can get them on the phone, you're going to be great. But then don't leave a voicemail. Voicemails puts them in control of the process because now it's generally up to them to call them back. Uh, my preferred system is you call, you don't get a response, text them and tell them who you are. And, and I'll give you kind of that rough outline in a minute, but call, text, and then email them. And that can be done through automations as well, but call, text, email. If you, if it's, you know, older clients, they don't necessarily have a cell and you have to leave a voicemail. Don't just say like, call me back here. Just do your voicemail, letting them know why you're calling and then tell them the next time you're going to call. But if they'd like to speak sooner, they can call you back here. But keep it in your hands when that next thing's going to happen because if you leave it to them to reach out, even if they think they will, they could easily put it off longer and longer and longer and might not end up doing it at all. And your one goal in this initial stage is just to get a reply. That's, that's all we're trying to get right now is to get them to respond to you because then you can start a conversation with them. So when you're thinking of like, what am I sending out? Is this something that we can get them to reply to us with? Um, and this is from Phil Jones, who's a great, one of the best sales trainers out there. Um, he wrote the book, Exactly What to Say. And then he even has a version called Exactly What to Say for Real Estate Agents. And basically the idea is every lead that comes in, your initial message, super simple, polite opening, you state a mutually mutually agreeable fact and follow it up with an easy to answer question. So that might look like something like if say you get a lead off one of your listings, you know, hi, this is Andrew Foliato with Just Sell Homes. 
I saw you were just looking at our listing at 123 Main Street. Are you looking at it for yourself or as an investor? That is an incredibly easy question for someone to answer. And it's to the point. It's not too complicated. Like I remember when I first sold, I started setting up some campaigns to get leads. And I've some of you probably heard this story before. Um, I remember the first email I ever sent to a lead I got. It was like, hey, this is Andrew. Um, I saw you reached out about my listing here. Um, here's some of the details about the listing. I'd be happy to show you this home or some other ones if you like. Um, by the way, if I'm going to show you this home, we have to either get you to sign a service agreement or a buyer representation agreement. Here's what a service agreement is. Here's what a buyer... I went probably almost a thousand words on that email. And as you can imagine, never heard from them again. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. And then I just started learning and learning. And basically now I'm showing you all the stuff I've learned and to make it simpler now. Uh, and you can cut that learning time quite a bit. But all you have to do in that initial one is just a polite opening. Hi, your name, your company. And then something that you guys can agree on. And normally it's related to the offer they just opted in on. So that could be like, I saw you were looking at this listing or I saw you at, you wanted to get a copy of our guide on how to prepare your home for sale. Did the copy make it to your inbox? Sometimes it can end up in spam. That's it. Super simple. As short as you can, they're more likely to respond if it's short. The longer you make it, the less likely you are to get a response. Then as soon as you can move off, like especially with listings move off that specific listing as quick as possible like answer their questions keep that promise but then move off as fast as you can to start talking about their specific situation because for example they reach out about a listing if you're just answering that one question about it as an example you don't necessarily know why that listing like was it the price point they're interested was it the neighborhood was it the school zone um, is it a military transfer? Like, what is the reason for them to be considering that home, that area, that price point? What's causing them to want to move? Um, and then David LaPointe has a question about what about sending them your testimonials? So testimonials are one of those things where you kind of want to bake them into everything that you do, right? You want them in different points in the process for you. So it's not just about okay, I'm going to send an email with a testimonial in it. Like there's some value in like that could even be in your signature. You can put them in there. In your ads, you could have some testimonials. On the pages that they're seeing, there's going to be some testimonials. Um, but you have them throughout the process where they make sense to go. Um, so collect as many as you can and then start seeing where you can fit them in. Um, but testimonial is incredibly important. Um, but at this stage, all we're trying to do right now is get them to be curious about us uh, or be curious about them so that you can get to this line, which is because of what you told me, here's what you should do next. This is one of my favorite lines for closing anything is the second you ask them enough questions that you know their situation pretty well, and you can say, because of what you told me, here's what you should do next. You ask questions until you can say this. And then once you know that, you go forward. And you always on these calls, text or emails, establish your next point of contact. Um, if you're brand new, you don't have testimonials. You don't. Um, what I did when I was new, um, I kind of leveraged stuff from the brand about like why our brand was one of the you know top. Like if you're say, for example, your brokerage or brand is like the top market share in the area, you lean heavier into that um, than necessarily your own personal testimonials, you know, that type of thing. Um, so always look for how can I leverage something here to show expertise. Um but when you're doing these follow-ups, always make sure you have that next point of contact. Because again, if you always just leave it as like, well, reach out when you're ready. The odds of them reaching out, especially over time, get less, less, and less, and less. So always establish that next point of contact you're going to have. Um, and I know what you're thinking. Andrew's really overdoing it with this mountain theme. But hey, that's where we are. Um, so always establish that next point of contact. What do you do about inactive leads, opening drip emails, but not responding to calls, texts, and emails? Great question. Um, so if they're opening, that's not quite inactive. They're still opening them. They're just, it means that whatever you put in there, they're just not ready for. Like I'll give you an example. When I was selling, it's actually one of the first leads I ever generated and the last one I ever closed before I stopped selling. At one point, they went dark on me for eight months. They didn't open an email, answer a text, answer a call nothing for eight straight months. Like we had been relatively for like six months talking pretty consistently and then eight months of dark. 
And then finally, out of nowhere, after eight months, they responded to an offer I had. I was hosting a first time home buyer workshop. They weren't even a first time home buyer. They'd bought like three or four, but it had been like 15 years. And I was like, whatever. I mean, it's something. I'm going to invite them to it. And they're like, you know, I haven't bought a home in so long. I think I'm going to pop by. Thank you so much for following up with me for the last eight months, even though I've been ignoring you. Right? Like sometimes it's just like, it's not the right place, not the right time for them. So don't take it personally that they're ignoring you. If they're still open, it, they're still engaged, they're still seeing it. It's when they unsubscribe, a little bit different. Um, but there are some moves here we can do, which I'll talk about in a bit about dead leads as well. And this would like similar to the workshop that's mentioned is always have something you can invite people do in the next little while. So I love workshops. You can have newsletters, you can have offers, but always have something that at any point you can offer them something and invite them to take advantage of it. Um, what do you do if you have dropped the ball and calling them? How do you reconnect months later? Just pick up the phone. Don't overcomplicate it. Like pick up the phone or text them and look at like, what was your last point of calling months before? If they had reached out about a four bedroom detached home, go grab another four bedroom detached home that's newly on the market and be like, hey, um, I know we haven't spoken in a few months. Last time we reached out, you're looking at a home. There's been a new one that came on the market similar to the one you were looking at. Would you like me to send it to you? So that way, if they do want it, they have to engage with you. And then you can start sending them that next piece of contact for them. Um, but don't overthink the, I haven't talked to them in a couple of months. They're not sitting there seeing like, oh, Sharon hasn't responded to me in a while. He hasn't been following up enough. Follow up now. Uh, worst case scenario, the worst case scenario, they tell you to stop contacting them. Like that's the worst thing that can happen there. Um, so just keep doing it. Yeah. And like Jess says, whatever you do, don't say sorry or use the word just. Um, just, <laughs> just get them information that's useful for them. <laughs> uh, but I always like having something to invite them to. And seminars, workshops, videos, really good tool for that. One of the other things you can set up is when someone becomes a lead is um, sending them retargeting ads. So this would be something like pushing a different ad out to them. And that leads into the waiting phase. So when we're looking at an ad, we want to send them like the retargeting ad, for example, they become a lead. Let's get them to book a call with us. Let's show them some brand values, retarget them with testimonials. Like one thing you can do is like create graphics of testimonials, like a carousel ad. And for like three bucks a day, have that targeted to all your old leads, right? It's not a big complicated thing there to keep doing that which then leads into stage two. So now that you've kind of either had that initial response from them. So again, they reach out to you to become a lead. You follow up with them. You either get a reply or you don't. Uh, if you get the reply, you start working with them. If they're going to be further out, you put them into your long-term follow-up, which we'll talk about in this stage. Um, but eventually you got to move them here. And the goal here is to keep them warm. And there's a few different ways we can go about this. But the goal here is you're going to keep yourself top of mind without being pushy. Because if they say they're two years out and you're like, are you ready to move? Are you ready to move? You want to go see this house? You're just going to annoy them. And it's going to really kind of make them want to go away from you. But if you can stay in front of them so that they just keep thinking of you top of mind, you're going to have a much better job of it. So one way we do that is regular fresh content. I'm a huge proponent of regular emails. Um, I think... The right amount is weekly for a lot of things. I mean, there's some, there's definitely scenarios where I'll send it more, but for clients that aren't ready to go yet, I like a weekly newsletter that is fresh content. Uh, so something that's timely, it's new. It's something that they can look at like, okay, whether I'm looking to move today or three years from now, I'm going to get some piece of value from this. I also like making it skimmable um, for more serious shoppers like daily emails even um are valuable but you got to know where they are in that process but uh, no matter what i think everyone should be doing a weekly newsletter um then you there's two ways that we recommend weekly newsletters option one is basically a state of the market and your thoughts on it your thoughts on it being the most important part um it could also be a deal of the week style email um, but with your thoughts on why. So it's not just send them a list and be like, here's the best deal on the market. Here's a listing. It's here's the best deal on the market we've seen in the last week. 
And here's why we think that. You have to give them information in this. They can't get anywhere else. Option two, which is what, like, for example, we do with some of ours, um, is what we do call a link roundup email. And this is the one so to tell, there's not enough time to write weekly emails. Um, you'd be surprised at how much business leads can get you when you do them so you can make time for it. But weekly roundup emails can make the time for it because they don't take a lot where what you can do is just, hey, here's what's in the news. Here's three stories that might be interesting about the community or real estate in our community. One or two sentences with a click to link to read more. One or two sentences, link to read more. One or two sentences, link to read more. So you're just giving them that regular fresh content that goes out. Like I will get more from this than a regular piece on social, to be honest. Like email to me is the highest ROI activity right now online. So I would put like, if I had the choice between doing say five, six posts a week on social media and two posts and a newsletter, I do two posts and a newsletter all day. Um, how about a video newsletter for market update once in two, once in two months? Um, so a video newsletter for market updates is good, but you also have other things that could go out besides like once a month. Because like, especially when we're looking at like converting a lead that came in today. If you send out your weekly, your monthly newsletter today, like this morning, and you get a lead that comes in an hour later, and then they don't hear from you for another month, it's possible they've forgotten who you are by the time your next one comes out in a month from now. A weekly one, if there's value in it, is just enough time where they're not going to forget who you are, but it's not so often that they can't ignore you. And if you make it something that's skimmable, they're more likely to opt in. Um, but I would, like I always tell you, like email usually has one of the highest ROI things. Um, the joke in online marketing, um, and I know there's a few people on the call who, who have heard this one before, is you only send emails on days you want to make money. Um, where do you find info? I mean, it depends on the style of email you're going with. If you're doing like the link roundup, I mean, the easiest one is just what do you find yourself reading as interesting. Uh, you can use a tool like BuzzSumo, and it'll just tell you the trending things and different topics online. Um, if it's, you know, just deal of the week style emails, it's just like, what's the best deal you've seen on the week? Well, you're already looking at MLS, just pull it out a few sentences. And when I say like, you have to tell them why you think it's a deal of the week, this doesn't have to be like a 500 word email. If it's a deal of the week and you can explain why it's the deal of the week in three sentences, explain it in three sentences. Don't overthink depth of content as long as there's value to it and something they can't get somewhere else. And then in all these newsletters and content that's going out, soft sells. Because we know these are kind of our long-term prospects, if you're too aggressive with, with it, you'll start turning them off. So we like to include just soft sells. Um, like I know I mentioned Dean Jackson, so that like when you're ready, here's how we can help you. Or a, hey, we have a seminar this week, come check it out. And then if they can't make it, you know, the next week and be like, hey, we just actually have a recording of the seminar we did last week on how to invest in real estate. You can check out the recording here. Then what you do, what we call harvest time. And that is you send out these emails and let's say you're doing like a roundup style email. Well, if in that email, it's like, here's some community news. Here's a local business we're featuring. Here's a guide on how to, down how to get your home ready for sale. They can download. Well, almost every CRM out there can track who clicks on links. If someone is reading your emails and they're reading different news, they're opening it. And of your, say, let's take a round number of a thousand people open your email and 10 of them click on a guide on how to prepare your home for sale. Those are 10 people worth picking up the phone and calling because they've shown this intent of, oh, they downloaded a guide on how to get their home ready for sale. Now you can just pick up the phone and be like, hey, I saw you got... You downloaded our guide on how to get your home ready for sale. Um, you know, are you planning to move soon? Again, simple, easy. They can say no. Be like, great. Well, what would you think of the guide? And then you kind of keep that conversation going, build a nice relationship, nothing over pressure. And then you keep them getting it from there. And we also like to say one that's worked really well is just, uh, you know, do you have any questions about real estate? Feel free to book a 15 minute call with us anytime you want. And then we use well, Calendly for this, but basically, and we let Calendly filter them into the right place. So for example, I've noticed like our conversion rates have shot up significantly when we switch from like 15 minute meeting, 30 minute meeting to 60 minute meeting 
to giving each of the type of calls a specific name. So like I just have one called sales call. If someone's willing to book a straight sales call, you know, they're going to have a much higher chance of converting than someone who books a free Facebook ad review. So sales calls are more open on my calendar. Free Facebook ad reviews are still fairly open, but it's not as available as my sales calls. Um, and we have pick my brain call. Like you can set some up like a team leaders. I've often seen them have one on there where it's like considering a career in real estate, click here to book a 15 minute introductory call about what that might look like for you. And it's a great way to let people filter themselves into the right place. Like you could have a 15 minute introductory call about buying a home, 15 minute introductory call about selling your home, book a more in-depth call, book a virtual um, like home value book an in-person one and you can set the rules for how, like how much time you need on either side of it, that type of thing. Um, but putting these here on Calendly allows people to self-select into the right camp. So when they book the call, you already know what the topic is about. You know how much time you need for it. You can set the frequency these can be booked at how soon in advance they can be booked at. It really does help a lot. Um, if you're sending out Calendly links, just don't just send and say, Hey, or book a time. You have to give them the option to use other ways. We find that people find it rude. Um, so we'd be like, you know, let us know a few times at work or if it's easier, use our Calendly. Um, which is funny. I was actually on a call with the people from Calendly and they saw that's how I emailed my Calendly link. And they said they're going to update <laughs> their best practices for all Calendly clients to include the same language that I was using because they liked it. Um, is it free? There is a free version of Calendly. I don't know the limitations, like how much you can customize the free version. Um, so I, I'd have to look that up and get back to you on that topic. Seminars and workshops are actually one of my favorite one um, to convert leads. A lot of people look at seminars and workshop as a lead generation tool. I look at even more as a like instead of a lead conversion tool or as a lead generation tool, a lead conversion tool. Um, like for, like I've noticed this for agents we've worked with, um, my own business seminars and workshops is where we convert the most clients. So it's not that like all generally, like if I host a webinar, most of the time I know everybody in the room who's going to be there ahead of time. Like I've already met them. We've have some level of relationship online and they come to an in-person event. And then they convert into a client after that. Um, that's why I really like this. It gives them an opportunity to get to see you, meet you, hear, and you see that you're an expert in an environment that's not overly pressure filled. Um, so I like these for these types of things. 60 to 90 minutes is a good length for them. Um, if it's something like investing, you could even do like full day workshops, potentially half day workshops. Um, if it's just like buying your first home, I'd keep those a little bit on the shorter side, but it's always worth testing longer ones. Um, you can always be surprised at how much a half day seminar can do well because it gives you even more time with them. Just know the longer you make it, the less people you'll generally get out to it. Um, for like first time home buyers, I'm a big fan of having a lawyer there with you. So partner with local people who will invite their people, but like first time buyers, I'm a big fan of having you do 20 minutes, a mortgage person do 20 minutes and a lawyer do 20 minutes and then open for Q&A after that. But find ones that work for you. And then when do you give up on a lead? Um, there's only really a couple ways that we look at this. And one is when Castle says you have to give up on the lead. <laughs> um, and then the other is only if they tell you to. Um this is a big thing. Like, don't stop. Like they was telling you before, I've had a lead that went dead on me for eight months. I just not without a lot of pressure, just kept making myself available and helpful. And eventually they actually thanked me for that and then came back. So you don't have to give up unless castle says you do. I've tried to do first time home buyer. Uh, I tried to do the first time home buyer seminar, hard to get people to attend. Um, so that's actually the toughest thing we find with, in-person seminars. This is also why it's easier to get a lead to it or a someone who's already been a lead to attend than a new person because that person already knows you a little bit. They're more likely to show up. But I'll give you an example. This was probably like six, seven years ago. I had a client. Um, they did two seminars. First seminar, there's like just generate the leads. We'll handle the follow-up. And then the next one, so that one they did. 
No, they had 18 registrations. Nobody showed up the night of the event. Turns out they didn't actually send follow-ups. They just assumed they'd show up because they registered. The next one, we did a three email drip sequence as soon as they registered for it. And then we sent out reminders. We sent out reminders again. And that they had 80% of the leads show up. So there are some things to do, but it's tough. Give a reach back out to unsubscribed. Um, <laughs> yes, over the phone, because if they unsubscribe from email and email again, you're violating it. Um, I have done things in the past, like if someone unsubscribes from our email, we will run Facebook ads targeting them to sign back up for my newsletter um, because you add them to a custom audience on Facebook and then you run them back in. Um, and we've had people unsubs like resubscribe at that point um, and check my record is 14 and a half years. See, 14 and a half years of follow up and they uh, converted. That's, that's a good one. Um, but basically you don't give up unless you absolutely have to. Um, and that's either through like castle rules or if they tell you to stop, like once they say like, stop contacting me, then yeah, you stop. But basically unless the law says you have to, or they say you have to, you keep going. Even if they haven't responded in a while, just keep going with it. And that's why I like having them on a weekly newsletter that's going out to everybody already. It's great because whether you're sending it to 10 people or 10,000 people, same amount of work for you. And then bringing back dead leads. Um, I mean, if you've been on almost any of my webinars before, I've talked about the Dean Jackson nine word email because um, it works. But basically the idea here is very easily. Someone hasn't responded to you in a long time. Send them an email that is short and sweet with a question that would make them reply. So as an example, like the Dean Jackson one would be like, if they've reached out about a home in Toronto, the subject line home in Toronto, are you still looking to buy a home in Toronto? Simple. Um, other ones that we've seen work well, if they reached out about a bungalow in Etobicoke, be like, hi, John, we have an, another bungalow in Etobicoke hitting the market soon. Would you like the details about it? They have to respond to get the details. Don't just send it to them because that brings back that dead lead, the curiosity of, oh, there's something available. I should, and they have to reach out to get it. They're now likely to start that conversation with you. Um, so like I would send out like once a quarter, send us out leads that haven't been responding. Either try the, are you still looking to buy a home or are you still trying to buy a home or ask it a very specific one. Like you were asking about this type of home before we have one coming up. Would you like it? Or would you like me to send you a couple more? Um, those work really, really well, but just short and sweet ones. And then I also try things like inviting them to a webinar, inviting them to a workshop that you might be doing. Um, you never know when that hits them at the right time and now they're interested in doing it. So generally kind of the flow is you make them an offer, collect their information, give them a secondary offer. Then you're also reaching out to them about it. And then if they don't become a client, you're turning, you're putting them into your long-term content. And that's what you want to work. So the blue section there is what you want to build out first. Once you have that built out, you can start adding the next pieces. So like the initial drip campaign, you get their info. If they take the double dip offer, the drip campaign they're going to do there. Um, then you can add retargeting. So anytime they make it to one stage, but don't move forward, retarget them to bring them back through that stage again. And then once they're in your long-term content, you start sending them situational offers. So if you know they've been reaching out a lot about investing properties, ask them if you'd like them to send you something specific or invite them to an investment seminar. Um, can we have a copy of this? Yeah, we're going to send out a copy of the recording as soon as we're done. Um, and I can also just like screenshot this and send it to you if you <laughs> want just the actual flow on its own outside of the screen. But start with the blue. Then I would, once you're done the blue, do the drip campaigns. So the ones in red there, then add in the retargeting after that. But don't generally do online leads until you at least have the blues built out. Um, so if you already answered this, but in general, what is your take on how fast to respond to leads? We did answer that, but that's okay. Um, I can answer that again. Uh, basically I think it's important. You do follow them as quick as you can, but to give yourself some breathing room to respond to leads, give the lead something to do after they become a lead. Most people, when they get a lead, just say, thanks, we'll be in touch or something like that. Instead be like, great. 
Thanks for reaching out about our listing. Do you need to sell your current home to buy your next? Click below to find out what your home would get so you can plan better when buying your next home. Give them that next thing to do so that they have activity they're taking. And now it gives you that breathing room to follow up with them while they're still getting value. Um, and if you need any help building out your marketing system and your conversion system, uh, please reach out to us. I think Jen's going to put the link in the chat um, about how we do, how we can help you build this all out. Um, but that's about as much as I'm going to sell you on it right now. But if you do want our help, click the link that Jen will be putting in the chat soon and we will work with you on it. Um, and what is the most important thing to do with, to get leads when you're new? So the easiest way to get leads is listings or like a list of home style campaign. Um, but just start getting them in. And if it, you don't have your own listing, borrow a list from someone in your office and get leads from it. Like a lot of leads, like ask them first. Don't just grab a listing and start advertising. I always recommend, but like, well, you'll find like, I remember when I sold, I did this a lot. Like I didn't, I think it was eight months in until I got my first listing. Um, so I just, every, like I did a featured home of the week, for example, on my blog. Um, and we kept doing it. Like we kept um, featuring a new home every week. And all I did was just reach out to people, whether they were with my brokerage or not. Like, I think in the history of me advertising other people's listings, when I reached out to them, only one person ever said no. Is it a good idea for new agents to focus on seller leads? Um, yeah, I mean, you got a list to last long in this business. Um, you need seller leads, but some of the best ways to get seller leads is to focus on the house they're going to move to as well. So you can get buyer leads that you know the type of home they're going, they're looking to buy. They'd have to sell their current home. Um, but I mean, to be honest, I think a lot of newer agents as well, there's a lot of value in um, jumping into something like jump joining a team, right? Like we'll have them provide you leads. Then you can work on your conversion skills because, you know, if you have the budget, getting leads isn't hard. Right, like leads, uh, getting leads is generally one of the easiest parts of this. It's converting them that's tough. So if you're brand new, like if knowing everything I know now, and I could talk to the person that I know when I was just getting into real estate, I probably would have said like, go join a team for the first year, not just like get leads in, learn how to convert better, and then see how business runs well as well. Um, but it's just a really valuable tool. So if you're newer even if it's only for a year or two and you know you're going to go on your own after that, it's probably worth it to join a team. Um, are there any other questions? I'm happy to stick around for a bit. We finished about five minutes earlier than planned. So we did a good job on that one. Um, we'll send out the recording to everyone who attended. Um, if you have any questions, as always, uh, you can either put them in the chat or in the Q&A section. I hope you guys found value in it. Appreciate the feedback. Um, but start converting leads, build this out, and then we can go from there. Um, but again, if you want help building any of this out, we are here to help. Um, so you can either send us some email, book a call, all that fun stuff. Um, but thank you for coming. Much appreciate your time. When we're done this, I'm going to take it. I'm going to put it on YouTube. And I, if you registered, I will send the link out to everybody who registered. And that's it. Thank you so much. Appreciate the feedback, everyone. And I hope you guys all have a great day. And we'll chat soon.